The City of Waterloo, in cooperation with its many active and inspiring entities, presents Heart for the City, a chance to hear and see what's going on in our city and to meet people who serve you, teach you, entertain you, help you, all neighbors, and like you. Make this a city on the move. And now, here's our host, the Honorable Quentin Hart. Welcome to Heart of the City, and thank you so much for taking time to join us. As always, we highlight just a few of the many worthwhile events, places, and things that make this an amazing city. And I'm Quentin Hart, proud mayor for the city of Waterloo. And on each episode of Heart for the City, we emphasize aspects of Waterloo life that may include your government, local events, sports, businesses, and education, among others. And I assure you, there are a myriad of things of interest for everyone. It takes many experienced and talented people to run a city. And the city of Waterloo employs more than 530 full and part-time employees in over 180 job classifications. It also includes five union employee groups. And the majority of these employees are hired through a state-mandated civil service process with oversight provided by the City of Waterloo. And our Civil Service Commission made up of three citizens appointed by the mayor. And while the city clerk no longer heads the Department of Human Resources like a few months ago, the clerk is in charge of multitude of functions and city responsibilities. And Susie Sayre served as city clerk since 2010, is now pursuing personal aspirations but taking her place by unanimous vote, of the, unanimous vote of the City Council is the former Deputy City Clerk, Kelly Felkley. She officially took over the City Clerk's position on October 4th, so stay with us and we will have an up and close personal look at the job of City Clerk after a brief message of interest. The Cedar Valley Sportsplex is your destination for fitness and recreation. You'll have access to over 50 classes per week in our state-of-the-art facility at no additional cost. Work out with like-minded individuals through our circuit training, aqua jam, and more. Customize your workouts on over 60 pieces of pre-core equipment. Our qualified personal trainers can help you achieve your fitness goals. Worried about the kids? Childcare offered seven days a week. Welcome back to Heart of the City. I am pleased to introduce Kelly Felkley, our own city clerk. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you for having me on. Well, how are you today? Very good. <laughs> so, Kelly, you how long have you been with the city? I've been with the city since May of 2015. Okay, okay. So, about a year and a half, and you, what position did you hold? I held the position of deputy city clerk. Deputy city clerk and became the city clerk. Mm -hmm. When was that? October? October of, of this year. October of this year. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your background, like where you're from and where you go to school at? Sure. Um, I'm originally from Belmond, Iowa. It's okay. a small town up by Mason City. I went to college at Waldorf College in Forest City, Iowa. I was a history major there. Um, once I left Waldorf, I came to UNI to get a master's degree in history. Once I completed my master's degree, I went to work for Dillon Law up in Sumner, Iowa where I also managed the movie theater in town called the Sunset Community Theater. Okay. Um, once I left there, I went to work for the city of Evansdale. I was okay. the deputy city clerk there, and okay. then from there I came to Waterloo. And educational background? Um, I've got a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in history. Okay. And I know you're also working towards certifications for mm -hmm. your clerk position. Can you tell us about that? Yep. There's a, there's a three-year program through the state of Iowa okay. to get a certified municipal clerk certification. Um, I've completed all three years of the coursework, now I'm just waiting for January to apply after I've been a clerk for three years. Okay. And and when we when we talk about a city clerk, a city clerk is not just a secretary, right? Taking taking notes at meetings. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what does your office do? How many people are in your office? But tell us a little bit about the clerks and the clerk's office responsibilities. Sure. Um, in our office we have three clerks and an administrative assistant and a deputy city clerk. Um, the clerk's office is essentially the record keeping function for the city. We maintain all of the um, minutes, ordinances, resolutions, contracts, projects for the city. Um, and then we also carry out licensing 
for the City of Waterloo, okay. so anything from pet licenses to peddler permits, you can come to our office and get those. We also handle rental registrations, and um, I handle the city insurance as well. And what's interesting about the clerk's office, you actually probably have minutes from how long ago? <laughs> we have, so Waterloo is a very old city, and right. it's a very large city, so um, we have minutes dating back to the 1800s. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So don't come ask for them. <laughs> <laughs> no, do come ask for them. That's, okay. that's what we're supposed to be doing for that, the public. That is, that is true. Um, so if a person wants specific information, uh, there was a city council meeting, and they can't find it on the website, um, they come to your office mm -hmm. to try to get information? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, they can call me and make a records request and okay. we'll fulfill it as fast as we can. And also, with regards to our meetings, um, how can a person see a previous city council meeting? You know, the, the city council meetings are so exciting. There's a lot of things taking place and they're just great information for people. And you missed the last meeting. How can they watch that meeting? Um, the city council meetings are replayed on our cable access channel. If you go to the city clerk's webpage, it lists out the different times that the meetings are replayed, or you can watch our meetings on YouTube, okay. and there's a link on the front page of the website to the YouTube channel for the city. So when it comes to information about the city, when it comes to records of meetings, when it comes to posting minutes of meetings or other information to have meetings, it all begins in the city clerk's office, and actually ends, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your office that people should know? Um, the city clerk's office, we, we really strive hard to be that first person that people will talk to when they come into City Hall. We're right there by the door. Um, customer service is a thing that we take great pride in. So if anybody has questions about anything about the city, my staff is always happy to answer. And, you know, if you ever need any kind of information or records or things like that, that's the primary function of the city clerk's office. All right, and thank you very much, Kelly. And we, we all know uh, how well qualified you are uh, for the very many, often complex and difficult tasks you and the clerk's office perform each day. And we would like to thank you, and the citizens would like to thank you for your service in support of me and the council. And I personally know just how incredible, incredibly busy you are. So I will let you get back to work. Thank you. All right. Remember when Thirty seems so old Now looking back It's just a stepping stone To where we are Where we've been Said we'd do it all Many have expressed concerns about the future of our youth and their ability to cope in a rapidly changing environment. How can they achieve self-confidence, be responsible, and effective leaders? Our educational system works on this constantly, but there is a unique organization in the Waterloo school system that motivates both male and female students to be self-reliant, responsive to authority, improve oral and written communication, embrace the importance of maintaining physical fitness and more. There is a federally supported program whose purpose is to instill those values of citizenship, service, personal responsibility, and a sense of accomplishment. Guess what that organization is? Guess what that front program is? It is the West High School Air Force Junior ROTC or Reserve Officer Training Court, whose instructors and cadets earned an overall unit assessment of score of exceed standards during the evaluation on October 26. This is the highest rating attainable and for the first time the ROTC group earn, has earned this rating. And here to tell us more about this is Major David Richards, commander of the Air Force Junior ROTC only one of three Air Force related programs in this in this state of Iowa. So welcome to our show, Major. How are you? Doing great, sir. That was a, a, a lot of dialogue and conversation about such a special program, but before we get to that start, can you tell us a little bit about you uh, and who you are and your background? Okay, I am uh, Dave Richards. I grew up, born and raised in the great state of Maine. 
uh, uh, okay, okay. Long Sorry. ways away from, uh, from Iowa. All right. uh, <clears throat> I joined the Air Force. I graduated in 1990, joined the Air Force uh, about a year later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I <clears throat> had my Air Force career in various assignments, and I ended up retiring in 2012 while I was at the University of Louisville teaching senior ROTC. Uh, I felt I enjoyed the kids, and I wanted to do something uh, with kids as I went forward in my retirement days. Uh, in uh, West High School, mm -hmm. had an opening, and I applied, and, uh, and I interviewed, and the next day they offered me the, the spot. Oh, so. wow, it made a great impression. But tell us a little bit about the purpose of uh, the ROTC or the Air Force portion. We read a little bit about it, okay. but tell us in a nutshell what that means. To me, it, it's about giving kids an opportunity to... Uh, to run a program, because our program is, is cadet run, it gives them a sense of responsibility, a sense of accomplishment. Uh, when I told the kids what we had achieved of an exceed standards rating, uh, the smiles and excitement and uh, jubilation that came from them w was amazing. And I think that's what we can do is we can give them the opportunity to prove themselves uh, doing things through the JRTC and then also see the fruits of their labor and the success when they get ratings like this. And you know what's interesting when you say the exceed standards is oftentimes you know it's about winning football games or basketball games or it's about you know if you have a small little business how much you 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 earn in uh, uh, investments. But when you're talking about this you're talking about investing in the lives of young people so much and seeing what they do with their character in all those areas mm -hmm. that you exceed standards that way. You know, to me, to me that's amazing because you're making, you know, young leaders. Um, when they, you know, one thing that we didn't mention, but what about self-esteem that comes from this type of program? Well, to be honest, sir, I think that some of it comes from even just wearing the uniform. I, I hear from a lot of teachers that, hey, the kids really look good today. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that some kids might look at it as, hey, I have to wear the uniform. We try and look at it as you get to wear the uniform. Uh, and then, like I said, the, the sense of accomplishment, even when we go on our drill meets and, and other things, and like this inspection, when they get to brief a retired colonel from the Air Force and he thinks that they did so good that he is raving to the administration uh, and the counselors at how good the kids at West High School are performing, and then when they hear that, uh, like I said, the, their esteem and their, uh, you can see it in their faces, it just goes through the roof. Right. And so, uh, no sagging pants, none of those things. You got your pants pulled yes, up sir. and you're, you're focused. Um, also, what I'm wondering about too, um, with regards to your fellow man and fellow human being, does it teach you first or community first? What, what are some of those lessons that are taught? I think Everyone should learn at some point that we need to give back to our communities because we've given, we're given so much from them. Uh, community service is the second most important number in, in the Air Force Junior ROTC program. Uh, our goal this year is to get 2,000 hours as a program. Wow. Uh, we're trying to average 20 hours per cadet. Uh, we ask for a minimum of 12, uh, but we're asking a little bit more this year to try, to try and step it up. And so throughout the process of the year or the time frame there in the program, um, what is what type of things are taught within their coursework that they learn? Curriculum wise, this year we're actually teaching a book called uh, that talks about exploration of space. Uh, I teach that. Uh, we also have a leadership curriculum that my uh, my counterpart, Master Sergeant Brian Norton, teaches. Uh, we teach marching and drill. They learn how to focus and and follow orders uh, from a commander. Um, and then we also wrap it up with physical training on Fridays. And so there are also some social events. Yes, sir. <laughs> I know, uh, what, what types of things do they do for that? Uh, we have a cadet in charge. We call him our morale officer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's their mm -hmm. job to set up things like paintball. We've done ice skating. We've done laser tag. We do lock-ins. We've done game nights. Um, we're, do, we're trying to go to restaurants as a group and, and set things up and trying to build that family atmosphere where their kids really take care of each other. So physical fitness, um, uh, social uh, obligations, uh, leadership are all the things that encompass and a little bit more. And if there's any young people or parents that's listening and are, are, um, that's watching this, what would, you, what would you tell them about gaining some interest from their young people? JRTC's fun. 
uh, we are a family and we try and, and treat it like that. Uh, you know, and if they're interested, they can stop by, talk to their counselors. We go and visit the middle school, so if they, if they are interested at a younger age, they will see us eventually. All right. Well, I want to thank you directly, Major David, um, for investing in the young people within this community and others for your uh, lifetime of service. And thank you for taking time to explain about this exciting and motivating program and for your leadership and service in developing young people again. Uh, may you enjoy continued success and congratulations on achieving the Distinguished Unit of the Award for three years straight. The West High Air Force Junior ROTC Citizenship Program is making a positive impact on cadets, the school system, and the community. Of this, there is absolutely no doubt. Thank you. Different words describe different people. But in the eyes of the law, there's one that fits us all. Human right number seven. We're all equal before the law. What are human rights? Find out at youthforhumanrights.org. In 1837, a blacksmith universally known by his famous name, John Deere, opened a 1,378 square foot shop in Grand Detour, Illinois. When John Deere fashioned a Scottish steel saw blade into a plowshare, the rest became history, and what a history it is. In 1918, with the purchase of the Waterloo Engine Company, maker of the popular Waterloo Boy Tractor, the history of John Deere crossed paths with our city. And in June of 2015, a museum, John Deere's only history museum, was opened near downtown Waterloo. Let's take a look. They couldn't tell anybody about what they were doing. Not even their wives could know. My name is Aaron Buzza. I'm on a mission to share why people dig Waterloo, Iowa. Today we're exploring the mighty green history of the John Deere tractor. The John Deere Tractor and Engine Museum takes visitors back to the very beginning of the John Deere tractor. Not only will you learn about the tractor and engine development, but you'll hear stories about the men and women who played a role in the history and success of the world's largest provider of agricultural equipment. While this is a history museum, high-tech, hands-on exhibits really bring the museum to life. This is our factory site interactive here at the museum, and it tells the history of the factory site where the museum sits. And if you want to see how it works, you can grab this water tower and place it on any one of the spots on the floor. The museum is located on the original site of the Waterloo Tractor Works. Museum manager Don Hendershot is the fifth of six generations of Deere employees in her family and proudly serves as a steward of the company's rich history. Your job is your life for so many years and to be able to come in here and feel the pride and be able to tell what you did for all those years, it's important to everyone. And it doesn't matter if you were the janitor or if you were the engineer that designed the tractors. Visitors to the museum will find it extremely personal to many, from retired employees who serve as tour guides to the collectors who put their tractors on display the exhibits combine hundreds of artifacts, collectibles, and pieces of history to tell a story that was written by thousands over the past century. So if I bring my kids, what are the things that they are able to do here? Well, there are many interactive uh, exhibits here at the museum for kids, but one of the favorites is this 7290 tractor. So kids can look at the cab and see what's inside and experience what a brand new John Deere tractor is like. While John Deere has several great attractions to visit across the nation, Waterloo is home to the only history museum where the visitors trace the long green line of working the land and the evolution from people and animal power to the tractors of today. See that history this weekend as the museum celebrates its grand opening this Saturday, June 13th. When we were planning the grand opening, we really wanted to make sure we stuck to what we are. So we'll have a lot more tractors out there. We'll have um, several demonstrations. Um, our company blacksmith will be out there. 
For more information about the places we saw today, and for additional information about the grand opening, check out the Travel Waterloo blog at TravelWaterloo.com, and visit our YouTube channel for a look at past episodes and travel ideas. The 18, the Dane Tractor became the first tractor produced for sale by John Deere and Company with the John Deere name. It's one of the oldest known antique John Deere tractors. And today in Waterloo, John Deere makes tractors up to 620 horsepower. With us to tell us more about the museum is Dawn Hendershot, museum manager. Welcome, Dawn. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. What, what a lot of history. Right. <laughs> you know, I think about it. My, my father, I am proud to say, worked at John Deere over 33, 33 years as well. So even my earliest memories, I can remember uh, John Deere and how much of an important role it has played us in, in, in my life. But can you tell us about your history with John Deere, earliest relatives, or uh, and when was that? Well, actually, I'm a sixth generation John Deere Waterloo family. My great, great grandfather was, so we trace it back almost, I would think almost to 1918. Wow. And all of my relatives have worked here in Waterloo. Um, my, we had one supervisor, and then my, my father and my grandfather worked at Product Engineering Center on new product programs. And then my mother retired from the foundry, and me, I, been, I spent 35 years here with the company, and most of it was in supply management. And the last six years I've been with the museum. And then I have a daughter that is a production supervisor in the drivetrain operations, which is right behind the museum building. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Um, wow, I'm kind of <laughs> speechless for the first time uh, with that. And, and, you know, honoring the history of your family and other families and the contributions John Deere has made, um, is, is that s sort of what the purpose of the museum is? Yes, the museum, you know, when, when they went through the redevelopment in downtown Waterloo and left that that all that space with the, the on the TechWorks campus with the two buildings that are left that TechWorks owns and then they had the the A and the A1 building and it was an empty office building so it was what are we going to do with this and so it was decided probably they started working on it in like 2006 what are we going to do with it and it, the idea of the museum came about and it also thought it would help with economic development in downtown Waterloo and so it, it is the authentic site, built in 1941. That building was where the two-cylinder tractors were actually designed and manufactured, and they rolled off the assembly line in a building that was in the parking lot on the north side of the building back then. So it's, it, it's the perfect place to celebrate tractors, to celebrate our entrance into the tractor business in Waterloo, and to really talk about what our employees and the people of this community have contributed to the company. And when you talk about um, diversity within our community, I know my, my, my father's brother was originally here, and he called my father from down south to come up because there's work uh, within the city of Waterloo. And my father came up and was able to get a job at John Deere. So um, it's just meant so many things to so many people, not just within this community, but across the world. And there are many different items at John Deere. Where do some of those things come from? In the museum? Yeah. The artifacts? Well, when we started out, we, we knew that John Deere did not own enough historical tractors to really be able to change them out and make the museum an interesting, com you know, a continuing, revolving mm -hmm. exhibit space. So we knew early on that we wanted to work with the collector community. And so we started working with them and finding out what people had and the fact that they can put their tractor in our museum is just so exciting for them and they feel like it makes their tractor worth more just because it's been there. And then of course as we as people come in and they see the story that we're telling they go home and they say you know we've got these artifacts or we have these things that would help tell your story. The company of course has an archives in in Moline so we've had people from all over the world bring things to us to add to our collection and to be able to put on display and in, in fact, we even have the original check that was written for the purchase oh, of the wow. Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company in the museum on display right now. Wow. And there are permanent, temporary exhibits, um, and how often are they changed? 
We have our storyline is fairly permanent. We, the way we designed the museum, we left it so that the way the story is rolled out, you can add and change things without changing the message. Mm -hmm. And so we have permanent exhibits that are there all the time, mm -hmm. but we do have an area that we ha we call our product spotlight, which is where we we can change out tractors, we can have temporary exhibits, we can do things to you know get people to come back and and share. You know, there's anniversaries that come up, there's tractor anniversaries, anniversaries of the company, which we know we have a major one coming up in 2018. So we have places where we can do temporary exhibits. And are there things for children there as well? Absolutely. We have um, interactives for all ages. We have an interactive plow so that it simulates what it's like to push a plow behind a couple of draft horses in the field. We have an, a horsepower display so that you can pull on a pulley and weights. You have to raise these weights to a certain level in a, in a short period of time, and it tells you how much horsepower is generated. So people of all ages can really understand what, when you talk about 620 horsepower in a tractor and when a, a half a horsepower is 90 pounds, oh, wow. and to try to lift that three feet in one second, it's a lot of work. So it really gives you an appreciation for, for what these machines can do for modernization and for farmers today. And even going back way in history, I know some may say Scottish plow, but there's also another name or other names of the the, the plow from earlier that we mentioned on there? We always refer to it as the self-scouring steel plow. Okay. Back in the, the day when, when deer was developing this plow, when they would push a plow in the field, the, the sticky Midwest soil would stick to the plow so they couldn't efficiently plow a furrow. Mm -hmm. And so he made a plow that would push the dirt away and make a nice furrow so that they could plant their crops. Okay. And as we as we wrap up this session, people people need to know this is a treat, this is historic, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn about uh, John Deere history in yes. this museum. Um, hours of operation and how can people get more information? We are open from Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. We have a website. You can go out on and look at JohnDeereAttractions.com, and the museum is listed under there. And that also gives information when we're having special events, mm -hmm. gives more information about the educational programming that we do with the schools in the area. Um, otherwise, stop in. We love to see people, and we have brochures that we can hand out. And if we need a couple trinkets or memorabilia, we have that in the store as well? We have a store that is connected right to the museum, and people don't have to pay admission to go into the museum to go into the store. There's an entrance right off the street, so Christmas is coming, so there people can come in and shop. All right, there you go. Great, great gifts for the mayor. Yes. <laughs> no, as long as it costs less than $2.99. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Don, for taking time to provide insight into the John Deere Tractor and Engine Museum. Anyone can observe John Deere tractors being made from start to finish on tours at the Tractor Works and watch operations at other water lo locations as well. Arrangements can be made through visitor services. John Deere has long been known as a leading manufacturer of agricultural tractors and is the sole tractor manufacturing plant left in the world that retains its founder's name. It, is, it also manufactures many other products as well. We are proud to have John Deere's modern manufacturing facilities in Waterloo, and we certainly appreciate the company's immense contributions to the city. Again, thank you, Dawn, and I encourage everyone to visit this great museum right here near downtown Waterloo. And stay with us. We'll be right back. It's the law. If you're approaching or passing a school bus and it shows a flashing red light, signal in a stop, you must stop at least 25 feet away, either in back or in front of the bus. When the red light stops flashing, proceed slowly and please watch for children. It's the law. Well, that's our show. We welcome your suggestions and feedback. Remember to tell others that these are episodes that are available on the City of Waterloo website at cityofwaterlooiowa.com and go to the special YouTube link 
and you can see upcoming episodes or any that you've missed. Looking for something to do? A comprehensive list of all area activities, events, dining, recreation, education, and more can be found on the Waterloo Convention and Visitors Bureau website, TravelWaterloo.com. There are also numerous videos about Waterloo places, events, and things in the Digging Deeper Waterloo series. It has an incredible listing for anything going on and around our city. Please join us next time and watch Heart for the City. Until then, I think you'll all agree, it's a great day to be in Waterloo.